All right. Thank you for those of you joining us and I'll probably have a few more joining, but uh, so Tracy and I had the opportunity to go to the BBC conference, which is Building Business Capabilities. It was in Orlando, Florida this year. Um, and so today we're going to be sharing our summary of what we learned. Some of our, there was so much information and so many incredible presentations and so many notes. <laughs> um, but we, we each picked our top three favorite ones to present for you today. So that's what we'll be discussing. So we'll just start out with some quick um, introductions. So my name is Celestia Garner. I'm a senior solutions architect. Uh, I've been at STG for 16 years. I have been working in the BA field specifically for 20 years. Um, started in development and worked in, in development for a decade prior and then made the transition into the field of business analysis. And yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, I am the president of the Utah IIBA chapter and uh, Tracy is also on my board. So um, anyway, do a lot of volunteer. I've been involved with that organization for over 10 years and um, it's been a really great experience to be involved with the IIBA. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, all right, Tracy, go ahead. And uh, I'm Tracy. I've been a business analyst uh, roughly the same length of time as Celestia and involved in the technology world in various industries. Uh, I do have my CBAP, the Business Analysis Professional Certification, uh, Scrum Master One, uh, Graduate Certificate in Project Management, a Master's in Enterprise Architecture, and uh, as if that wasn't enough, I'm working on a doctorate in strategic leadership. And uh, in my spare time, I, I work on my coaching practice and uh, podcasting and, and a host of other things. So happy to be here and happy to be talking about the IIBA um celestia and i have known each other for many years through iaba and uh it, it's been a tremendous it's made a tremendous impact in in my life and in my career so that is me thanks all right so as i mentioned we're for our agenda we're going to each we'll just go back and forth and talk about some of our our favorite presentations so we'll start out with um, uh, uh, the keynote, uh, which I'll be talking about on, on AI and the role of BAs um, in the AI world, and, um, and just a little bit of information about what AI is. Um, and then Tracy's going to talk about key points to remember in navigating change. Then I'll talk about Future Proof, which is the newest book uh, that the IIBA sponsored, um, and uh, it's Business Agility Through Combining Analysis and AI. Then Tracy's going to talk about building your best toolkit. I'll talk about the indistractables holding stakeholder attention. And then Tracy will talk about selling business analysis to reluctant stakeholders. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So, actually we did that in slight reverse order. Tracy will start with key factors to remember in navigating change. All right, so uh, this presentation was on their business architecture track. Um, gentleman's name was Court, and uh, he is a well-known business architect, uh, practitioner, and consultant. And uh, some things that we talked about were um, how do you really navigate change in organizations, things that you need to remember, are that there can be some resistance to change because it's a new and different way of doing things. Um, change should align with an overall company strategy. Should be um, aware of the resources that will be, need to be managed as you approach the change. And then really monitoring and tracking uh, the progress as well as the impact of the change that's going on. So a couple of things that he made a distinction of, and uh, I thought this was important to 
dive into a little bit was uh, he made the distinction between roadmaps and transition plans. Especially as business analysts, I think we often um, get caught up in the tactical side of solutions. Uh, and it's important for us to sort of level up so that we're really thinking ahead as, as far as what is a roadmap looking like and how is it that we're going to get there. So roadmaps are a high level visual representation of the strategy. There are going to be things that talk about what needs to be done and when. Uh, their scope is going to be broad and strategic. The audience is going to include executives, um, partner stakeholders, et cetera. And the utility aspect of it is that um, it's a way to sort of align all of the various groups of stakeholders on the strategic vision of the organization. On the other hand, transition planning the, the, is the tactical execution needed to achieve the milestones in the roadmap. So as you're getting into the transition planning, you're going to be focused on the detailed planning. It's going to be short to medium term. Uh, think, for example, of sprints or sprint cycles. Uh, the scope is going to be narrower, more tactical. The audience is going to be different. It's going to be primarily the PMO and the implementation teams and the operational leaders. And uh, the utility aspect of it is that uh, you need to really translate the strategy that comes from the roadmap into those actionable plans that uh, line everything up. So I thought that was very valuable, uh, especially. Um, we do tend to get focused on the more tactical aspects of our roles. And I, I think the way the world is going, that's no longer going to be sufficient for us, for our careers, for our organizations. So moving on to Celestia. Thank you. All right, so the keynote of the presentation or of the conference was given by Jim Stern. And he was talking about generative AI. Um, and he started out using uh, just kind of a history um, in how we kind of started out with code. Um, you know, if A, then B, if B, then C, if C is greater than five, then D, or else E, you know, so just finding those basic formulas for code. Um, and then we have spreadsheets, right? And spreadsheets are a way to map different variables, doing calculations and things like that. Um, then we move into the, um, to we start moving into machine learning, predictive learning and machine learning, um, which is kind of that example with all of the dots, or, or sorry, predictive analysis. And that's where we take all of this information, we try to really um, start finding predictive patterns in them. And then we move into machine learning. Um, and that's really zoning in on specific areas of what it is of all of this data and information and what it is that we really want to focus on. Um, so all of this goes into, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, starts getting into AI. And one of the things to consider in AI is um, what they call LLM, so large language models. Um, so this is a way that we can start asking, we can ask a question and then it can start predicting what, what kind of word would go next. So the example he gave was the cat in the blank, right? And so he put that in to the AI and said, okay, give me an example. And so the AI then goes through and, you know, it, it's doing kind of a check, like the cat in the window, the cat in the store, the cat in the hat, the cat in the tree, the cat in the chair. And then it's trying to learn um, through what you're putting in there and just the way that we speak through language models, what, what word likely comes next. And so you can see here, hat has the most check marks. And so therefore it's going to return, say the cat in the hat. Thank you. So then we get into generative AI. Um, so generative AI, uh, we look at uh, GPT, so that's generative pre-trained transformers. 
And that's where we can start um, going in and uh, and going through this process of giving it different words and different prompts um, throughout. So what we're trying to do is get it to guess the next word. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, and so what happens is it takes the word relationships and those become vectors. Um, and then it fine, fine tunes the information by adding context. Um, the embedding distinguishes the topic and really hones in on that. And then you've got um, the retrieval augmentation and it helps you guess the word. It kind of makes it makes it up so it does need training and inputs to learn what it is that you're trying to, what word you're trying to find. Um, and you need to make sure that you teach it to check for biases. Um, so that's a really important factor when you're when you're dealing with AI is um, making sure that those things are taken into account and also providing correct math formulas. Um, it's it's not just <laughs> it's not code. It's not a calculator. If you want it to be giving you numbers, you need to make sure that you're giving it the proper formulas to give you the results that you want. And ultimately, it can be GPT can be really helpful for brainstorming ideas. Um, it's going to give you information, but you shouldn't ever just take what it gives you and assume that that's going to be exactly what you want. You need to make sure you proofread it. Um, if you need more information, then provide continue providing more guides for um, the best result, and then always read through it and make sure that it's what you need. Don't just copy and paste it into an email and send it and think, oh yeah, that looks good. I think that's what I want. Um, so that's GPT. Uh, next slide. And then that leads into prompt engineering. Um, and so prompt engineering um, is uh, basically like a conversation with a new person. So if you're thinking about, you know, you meet someone new um, and you're trying to explain something, think of it as a conversation back and forth with yourself and um, and the AI and, and provide additional context. Um, it's really important to be clear. Um, the more details give you more relevant answers. Um, specify steps required to complete a task. Um, provide examples. Um, and uh, and then look at the context. And so it gave the example of asking, you know, certain questions: who you are, what you're tasked with, how you're using it, and why, why, because. And so using those prompts um, or those topics, it can then um, provide more info. So who? So then down below you can see the the who, the what, the how, the why. Well, those are information and provides context that you can then put in um, to be able to get better results. Um, yes. All right. Oh, yeah. Next up is Tracy. <laughs> so uh, this was a really fun presentation that uh, we attended uh, from our friends, Heather Milan Mains and Thea Soren. Um, building our best toolkit tools to better understand and inspire people with whom you work. Um, the reason I thought that this was an important thing, it, it's because especially as we spend time in the development center, as we're looking to be on new projects and, and uh, find new opportunities, uh, it's super helpful for us to have um, a toolkit of techniques and things that, that we use in our engagements. And uh, some of these that they came up with um, were ones that I was not as aware of. So we'll, uh, we'll talk through these just a bit. The first one they talked about was a structured problem statement. It's a technique that I was a bit unfamiliar, unfamiliar with, um, but it's a way to align everyone on the same goal at both a, a macro level and a micro level. So uh, in this example, they would um, say the problem of X affects Y, the impact of which is Z, and a so successful solution would look like this kind of thing. So something that I thought would be interesting, especially as, as we're going in our um, initial meetings, uh, 
and engagements to really help us understand more what is being requested, what's going to be important for the client in the long run. How can we help provide them with the best solution? The next thing they talked about was stakeholders. And, and I think most of us are familiar with stakeholder analysis and, and uh, how we need to uh, manage the different stakeholders on engagements. But something that we may not always think about is sort of the people side of our stakeholders. And this was something that uh, Heather and Thea brought up was uh, really we need to be thinking about what are the strengths and skills and aptitudes of our stakeholders? What are their goals and motivations? What are their commu communication styles? How do they um, prefer to receive appreciation and questions and that kind of thing to really help us in our relationship building with our stakeholders and clients, um, which in the long run are going to make our engagements more successful. And then the last one they talked about, which uh, is something that all of us should be aware of and uh, really um, using is the RACI matrix. And RACI, again, that stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And as we're diving into project tasks and um, requirements and stories and, and design sessions and that type of thing, we really should be keeping track, not just at high level of our stakeholders, but really um, including them in every part of the decision-making progress. So as we're tracking our decision logs in our meetings and our design sessions, we should be considering our various stakeholders and, and really have, have a real micro level of, of a RACI matrix. Again, something that was a little new to me, I've done the RACI matrix at the you know, higher overall project level, but really diving into the, the task level uh, can be super, super helpful. back over to Celestia. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was a, such a great presentation, the one that Tracy was just talking about. Um, Heather and Thea are just really engaging speakers and good friends and good people. Um, and they provided so much, so many examples. They just went through like a full toolkit of so many different tools and techniques and and um, it, was, it was really, really great. So it was, it was a nice presentation. And um, Heather, one of the presenters from that, um, we're hoping is going to be coming and presenting at one of our um, IIBA chapter meetups in July. So yeah. All right, moving along. Um, so the IIBA uh, sponsored a book, a new book that just came out called Future Proof, Business Agility Through Combining Analysis and AI. It was written by in a collaboration effort between Angela Wick and Tim Coventry, um, two really great uh, thought, global thought leaders in the field of business analysis. Um, so they talked a bit about, you know, there's a new urgency going on with businesses with AI. Um, and it's kind of, they said, it, it, a kind of a survive or die kind of scenario of people you know, people know, okay, well, we need to, we need to be using AI and companies keep saying that, oh, we have to use AI or they're like, oh, we don't need to use AI, right? And um, the, the truth is just given where the industry is going, it's, it's not something to be <laughs> ignored and it is something that businesses need to understand and, um, and get good at. And, and not just using AI just to use it, but really understanding AI, how it can benefit their business and their processes. Um, they also likened it to when the internet started evolving and um, companies started getting websites. And then for a lot of companies, they they waited, right? Just because they said, oh, we don't need a website or, oh, we're not, our users aren't technical, you know, we just sell car parts, you know, we don't need a website. And a lot of businesses that did not um, 
join that effort of having a website, a lot of them didn't succeed and um, lost business because of it. And so again, just kind of this whole AI <laughs> thing, it's, it's newer, I won't say it's new, because it's been around for a little while now, but, um, but companies are finally starting to realize we really need to understand more about AI, how it will help our businesses and, and why. So uh, one of the things that they talked about was um, this good, bad, and ugly analysis. So thinking of the field of BAs, how do BAs fit in with AI, right? And how can BAs utilize AI um, to help do their job better? Um, business analysts are um, faced with a lot of pressure to increased pressure for delivery times. Um, dealing with compliance, making sure that, that what we're doing, requirements writing, everything we're doing is, is falling in line with compliance regulations. Um, and um, very specific customizations, particularly in our field of doing custom software. And so, um, you know, these are all things that AI can actually help us with. So they provided this example that you can see on this slide here. Um, so ugly analysis would be a complete lack of strategic linkage with, in analysis work. No AI, you can get detailed tech specs called requirements created by, by a BA as they take notes on what stakers, stakeholders say that they need. AI assisted um, using AI tools can write requirements for the team or the BA, but analysis doesn't really happen. Projects continue to fail and miss the mark. Whereas a fully AI enabled solution um, create solutions that are recommended by an AI agent, decisions are made and accepted, change is implemented properly, and the projects are successful in the end. So this obviously is not, a, you know, every single time, you know, we do BA work without AI often <laughs> and, um, and, and still have success. So this doesn't, this is not a, a, an either or scenario, but it's just an example of, um, how AI can be implemented with the BA. All right, next slide. So one of the, the basically this book talks about this um, AI analysis accelerator framework. And it's really um, about strategic alignment within the company and it's within corp companies and how we can use it. So. It basically says, take a look at your assets um, and then start doing hypothesis, hypotheses and experiments um, with AI. Um, you want to identify risks. You want to look for spikes. And, um, and this uh, also includes like iterative development, um, just trying things out and uh, really honing things in. Um, and development spikes. Let's try this out. Let's see if it works. And then we can have something to build upon. Uh, the next tier up is team tasks and activities. Um, this is where we have continuous analysis that goes through um, as a project is going. Then there's deliverables. Um, and um, the deliverables reduce cost overall because by, by Having all of these things together and, and building upon them, um, we can reduce cost. And then the user behavior changes. Um, that is an outcome of being able to streamline some of these other things and using AI to help on these different levels. And then at the top is business results. Um, and that's really where you get increased profit, increased revenue, and um, can really see true change. So the strategic alignment um, is aligning the work to a strategy, um, really looking at the data and continuous use of assets. So um, the, the goal and point of a lot of this is there is still a need for BAs. Um, we just need to get better at understanding the role of the BA using AI. Um, so we need to um, at, make sure that we're asking the right questions um, and we need to make sure we're asking the right questions of our stakeholders and also asking those questions, the right questions using AI to help us understand what we should ask. 
Um, so this is a set of questions, and I know it's a little small, but just an example of facilitating a question a conversation by asking questions like what specific problems are we trying to solve for with AI? What users are we are we trying to make something easier? Um, what actions will tell us this is working or not working? Um, do we understand how AI in this process may give us a less effective user experience? Um, what are the risks? Do we have data to validate the problems and significant widespread enough among our user bases? How will solving this problem improve the end-to-end -end customer journey experience? And so on. So just some of the things that we, we should be looking at and thinking of as we're preparing for conversations and questions with our stakeholders, and also as we're putting those things through AI. Um, to level up here, um, we need to get better at strategic alignment. Um, BAs need to make sure that they're keep, still keeping up on core skills and competencies within the field. Um, we need to make sure that we're continuing to look for problem solving, using critical thinking, and know how to use AI data dashboards. Back to Tracy. All right. So uh, this was a session uh, by our friend Adrian Reed. Uh, Adrian uh, is based in the UK, and uh, if you follow uh, perhaps his Black Metric newsletter, um, that is who Adrian is. And his session was about selling business analysis to reluctant stakeholders. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've run into in my career uh, stakeholders who will try and get away without business analysis. And um, so we need to address that problem so that our, our stakeholders trust us, so that um, we have more influence on projects, not just as projects are underway, but influence as projects are even being considered. So these are a few things that uh, Adrian talked about in his session. The, the first was influence. So as, as we want to become an influencer with, within a project and, and within organizations, are we just another resource or are we a trusted advisor? He also talked about giving them something to say yes to. I, I think we would all agree that often the business analysts are, are sort of faced with being the person that says no. So we need to give them something to say yes to. And we need to be more focused on the benefits and outcomes of our projects. So as we talk about levels of trust, um, Adrian talked about there are, are or four levels of trust. And the first is really transactional. It, it's very basic. It would say be a stakeholder saying, hey, we just bought Salesforce. Come write me some user stories for how we're going to uh, implement it and you know, make sure that we can do that next week. Versus, um, hey, we're thinking of buying Salesforce. Uh, do you think you can help us? or we could uh, have an interaction where they actually come to us. We, we have a problem with customer retention. Can you help? How can we be more of a trusted relational advisor at those really higher level strategic questions? Which means that we're going to need to change our approach. Um, means that we're going to need to show concern for our stakeholders' problems. Um, we're going to need to understand, okay, what is it that we're trying to pitch to them? What uh, solution are we uh, consulting them on and, and making recommendations on? And are we gonna be the, the point of contact for them going forward? So as we think about giving them something to say yes to, we need to really think about the salesmanship and the process and how we're actually telling that story. So as we get into our projects, we need to be telling them, hey, this is the progress we're, we're making. 
so that we're not quite so focused on the challenges, but on the progress that we're making and that we're really telling them the, st the story and um, sharing with them the successes that we're having as, as the, the project is ongoing and how it's benefiting them. And again, focusing on those benefits and outcomes, which means uh, back to actually some of the questions that uh, were being asked uh, for the future-proof AI, you know, really why, what, how um, was really going to make this impactful? What makes it import, important? How is this going to solve the problem? We then need to deliver as promised and we need to shout about the success that we're having. Back over to Celestia. This was a really fun presentation, by the way. So, so I'm glad we're talking about this one. It was very cool. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, so this presentation was called The Indistractables, and it was by Patty and Grant. Um, Patty and Grant are two amazing global thought leaders, and I'm happy to call both of them friends, um, just great individuals. And they have so much energy. They give great presentations. Um, they have a podcast, which I listen to often, <laughs> and uh, they, they pr produce a lot of content out in the, the BA world. Um, so this presentation, as always, is very fun. They, they came out in capes and uh, superhero masks and, and superhero capes and, um, and likened, uh, well, I'll, on my next slide, I'll talk about some of the, the different superheroes that they created um, around uh, this concept of a human-oriented stakeholder engagement. Um, so they created this model uh, based off of several things that they were finding in the industry. Um, they, they talked a lot about distraction. We're very easily distracted. Um, they said that current, current um, statistics say that the average attention span is 47 seconds. <laughs> Um, on uh, particularly when it comes to social media. Um, and when we are distracted, it takes around 25 minutes to regain productivity after a distraction. And a distraction is really, they defined a distraction as something that pulls you away, whereas uh, traction is something that drives you to a thing. So there's traction and distraction and how those two things really, it's kind of a push and a pull. Um, a distraction isn't does, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can be, especially in our workday, it can be a Slack message, it can be an email, it can be a, a conference call, whatever that is, but that pull, that is pulling us away from the task at hand that we're trying to focus on. And it really does take a lot of time to regain that focus. Um, so they came up with this human-oriented stakeholder engagement model um, to help uh, with distractions. They created this new manifesto, they called it, um, similar to the Agile manifesto, using similar terminology as the Agile manifesto. Um, but their manifesto is to engage over lecture, to use visuals over text, to use creativity over conforming, and bite size over too much information. So really just engaging, using visuals, being creative, and making sure that things are, are bite-sized information. Um, they gave some additional statistics around visuals going to your brain um, faster. 65% uh, of people are visual learners. That's a, a high percentage. It's a higher percentage than any other type of learners. And so chances are, if you can find ways to use visuals in presentations, in meetings, in trying to communicate data, it's people are going to learn it. They're going to um, remember it. And uh, it, it'll be easier for people to understand what it is you're talking about. Um, and... So let's see. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Here we go. So in the presentation, I know these are a little bit small, or I was going to go and do all of them in a larger size, but didn't uh, quite get to that point. 
but they created these different superheroes um, that they called them. Um, so Nura is the um, is about the indistractable mindset. Um, so using our, our brains, as you can see here, to really make sure that we have a mindset of, of being indistractable. Um, Vizzy is an eyeball and is a visual thinker. Um, Auditron is an ear and focuses on listening and understanding. Andy is the hand, handy Andy, um, is about facilitation and action. And Inspiro is the heart, and that's about engaging and imagining, or engaging and inspiring. <laughs> Um, so overall, um, with the indistractables, um, we need to focus on reducing distractions, finding ways that we can do that, whether that's, um, minimizing, uh, uh, alerts that pop up, um, putting your phone on silent and putting it away, um, and, uh, and, and focusing, making, setting aside time, focus time to really focus on a task, particularly high priority items that, that need to be taken into account. Um, using visuals, again, just finding really creative ways. And, and these two, Patty and Grant, are, are really great at um, using visuals, uh, but uh, you know, just finding ways that we can do that to help in learning and, and thinking in visual ways. Um, listening. Um, we need to make sure that we're being attentive, empathetic. Um, facilitation, we need to have an agenda um, and, and not just a recycled agenda. They actually said recycling agendas often make it to where people don't pay attention to the agenda because it's, it's the same, so they just assume it's going to be the same, so they don't really look at it. And so they said, rather than recycling agendas, really look at ways to um, come up with uh, you know, really, what is the clear purpose and goal of this meeting? Why are we meeting? Does this meeting have to happen? And if it does, great. What do we really want to focus on in this particular meeting today? And just creating better, more clear, concise agendas. Um, and noting that people are generally more alert at 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um <laughs> They suggested shortening meetings to a half hour versus an hour. Sometimes we just default meetings to be an hour because that's just how it defaults in our calendar or what we think of. So looking at ways to say, okay, can this be a 30 minute meeting instead of a one hour meeting? Or even can this be a 15 minute meeting more like a stand up versus a 30 minute meeting? Um, to make sure that we're, we're not just repeating the same things that we're doing them with, um, with clear intentions. Um, They also recommended having no meeting days. Um, and I actually, I've worked at a company that had one day a week where there were no meetings. Every Friday we had no meetings, not a single meeting to be scheduled on Fridays. Um, and it really, it, it seems impossible, especially for those of us that are in a lot of meetings and very busy and trying to get, you know, coordinating in so many different areas, but it is truly possible. And it really is so effective. Um, to be able to have a day to really just focus on work and not have distractions pulling us away from that productivity. The increase in productivity is really drastic. They gave an example of a company that actually did two days a week of no meetings. They actually tried several different variations. They tried um, a few days and then they tried no day, it went back to no days of no meetings and they found that two days they they're in their productivity increased so much by having two days of no meetings um, a week. Uh, they uh, noticed that if they did more days without meetings, then productivity declined, obviously, because there wasn't enough communication going on. There wasn't enough uh, collaboration. Um, so anyway, they, they urged everybody to really try to find that, that balance and um, when, when possible, see, see if you can find ways to have no meeting days. Um, so, and again, I've experienced it and it is really powerful. Um, and then being inspiring, um, engaging and inspiring. 
Um, they talked about using metaphors and analogies. There's some overused ones out there for sure. And, and you know, don't go into full, you know, using, uh, you know, just those words that um, ever, you know, business speak, like high business speak words that really don't mean a whole lot, that don't don't really go with what you're trying to say. But, but you know, you find a way um, to inspire through metaphors and analogies. Um, it's a, a way that people can um, have empathy, people can relate better to what it is you're talking about and have better comprehension of, of the topic. Um, they gave examples of doing things um, uh, like doing a pecha kucha. I know we've, we've done that um, some, uh, at least in the product delivery practice and pecha kucha presentations. Um, so that's basically where you have 20 slides. Each slide is 20 seconds. And it's typically just um, an image on the slide. And you just speak to that image for 20 seconds. And then you go to the next slide and you speak to that image for 20 seconds, and the next one, and the next one, and the next. Um, it's it's a really fun technique um, and uh, and provides a lot of information in a short amount of time and makes you really focus on being very concise. Um, and then they talked about the Jenga technique um, where uh, basically building the tower, like a Jenga tower, the game, um, really getting all of your is getting all of your ideas down. Um, and then removing blocks are taking out unnecessary things from a brainstorming, you know, getting all the ideas out there. Then we take out the ideas that that aren't really going to work, that aren't effective. And then you balance um, and you add and take. So you just continue kind of taking away things until you've really got your concise message um, and you're you're really simplifying complexity at that point. All right. Back to Tracy. Oh, no, that's the end of it, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I put our contact info on here. Um, it looks like everybody on this call is pretty much um, STG and knows how to get a hold of us that way. I also put a link, um, some links here to our IIBA Utah chapter if anyone's in interested in learning more about that and um, to the STG website. So, yeah, we'll open it up to questions. Any questions, thoughts, comments for either of us? I will say that that um, I, I've been going to the BBC conference for years, and it's one that I definitely look forward to. If I had to pick one conf, if I could only go to one conference a year and say, okay, this is the you only get one in a year, I would always pick this conference year over year. Um, they do change the location frequently, um, or you know, every year it's somewhere different. Uh, they do repeat locations multiple times, but they um, they do uh, cycle through where it's at. Um, Tracy, you remember where it's at next year? Is it? I believe it's Phoenix. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's somewhere in Arizona. Um, so it will be next year. We will put information out there about the conference as we receive it. Um, but it would be great to have more people from STG go. Um, they have many tracks um, at the conference. Uh, this one had a really strong um, focus on uh, on AI. Um, and uh, business architecture, um, both of which are, are really big in the industry right now. They have leadership tracks, they have business tracks, they have product tracks. Um, so there's a little bit of something for everyone in there. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, it's, we learned so much. I mean, we've, this was a lot of content to fit into, you know, a, a presentation. Uh, but uh, we, we attended even more presentations than this and had even more. So it's really, it's so much information in just a couple of days, but it's, it's really inspiring. It's really helpful. It's very beneficial. And we're looking forward to having others join us. I, I might ask a, a question maybe to the group on the call if, if anybody feels like uh, answering. Are there any of the techniques or uh, topics that we've, talked about here that you're seeing in your engagements, uh, anything that you might consider trying as, as you uh, go into new engagements, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on them. I um, am not really right now doing um, engagements for new projects. 
However, uh, looking back at one of the projects that I've been working on recently, using the techniques that you had for the, the manifesto, just getting the, them interested and focused is it's huge. I am going to delve into that and see if that's a thing that I can use to help keep um, a variety of different stakeholders that I have from the different paths, you know, grow crops, permanent plantings, cow, that kind of thing, all engaged and in working towards a common goal. So thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks. If, and you I, know, I suppose, if you don't know Gwen, uh, yeah. Gwen is uh, uh, an IIBA Utah board member as well. So happy to have her here with us today. Thank you. All right. Well, if people have any questions or if as you're going through, you know, work and something is, is sparked from this presentation that you'd like to learn more about or get a refresher, please let us know. We do have copies of all of the slides from all of these presentations and lots of notes and lots of things that we didn't even have time to go over um, for each. Of, I mean, each one of these was an hour presentation and we spent about three to five minutes on each. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. so if, if any of this sparked interest or you'd like more details, please reach out to either of us and we'd be happy to share some information with you. Um, if you want to get in contact with some of the people who, who presented on these topics, we can do that as well. Um, and yeah, so just reach out if anybody has any questions. And, and maybe before we go, Celestia, we could do a plug for the Future Proof presentation next month. Yes, so I, I talked about that book, Future Proof. Um, and I really touched on a very high level, um, but Angela Wick and Tim Coventry will be doing a webinar um, and a, a full hour web webinar talking through the concepts of that book and really going into in depth on each of the topics. Um, and that book is available at IIBA.org um, or on Am you could go to Amazon and find it, uh, but also IIBA, you could find it. If you're an IIBA member, I believe you get a free copy of a digital copy of it, um, I believe. Uh, but they'll be presenting on that next month. And so the uh, Western region of the IIBA, all of our chapters are combined. We're doing a combined chapter event. Um, for them to present on on the book and really talk about the book in more detail and they'll open it up to q a as well so if anybody is interested in joining that you can you do not have to be an iiba member to join but you do have to register um, for the event and um, it will be it'll be a great one so um trying to remember when that is do you remember when that is let's see when do you recall is is that end of month or middle of Middle of June. Yeah, I don't have the date yet, but we will post to that about that. Um, we'll we'll send some information out about that when we have it specifically July, on the date and time. But looks like July sixteenth at six um, six p.m. Pacific, seven p.m. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so July July. 16th um so yeah that'll be a great event um and again uh, if you want any more information on future proof and um, ai with business agility um let us know and and we can connect you with the information for that webinar that'd be great thank you so much thank you thank you all for being here we appreciate it appreciate it thanks thank guys so thanks